past half past eight. Oh, it's just gone half past eight, actually. We're going to mute everybody. And please uh, stay muted for the benefit of everyone else. Um, welcome. Lovely to see everybody who's been able to join the Shia so far. And thank you to Rabbi Portnoy for uh, hosting it for us this evening and uh, making sure that as people want to join during the course of the next few minutes, they'll hopefully be able to do so fairly smoothly. Um, the title of the shears you will have seen from the flyer that went out uh, is we're focusing on three particular subjects gmt bsd covid and aeropesach on shabbos um not necessarily in that specific order um but the way that i've titled it for those of you who've got the sources in front of you and if you go into the chat you can actually see on the chat a, uh, the, the source sheet is attached, so you can open that up um, to be able to follow if you don't have the source sheet in front of you at the moment. Um, I think there's still some people in the waiting room, so we will admit those who will be able to then uh, join us. Okay. Um, right. So um, the, the title that I've given this in the... Uh, in, in the actual source sheets, as you'll see, is Ma Loinishtana Bashana Haze. The play on the Manishtana, obviously, what's actually not changed, what's not different this year. Um, it seems that it's almost a perfect storm of different circumstances affecting us this year. And yet there is perhaps reason to be a little bit more optimistic than last Pesach. I'm not sure any of us foresaw that uh, by this time this year, we would uh, still be having to struggle and cope with the challenges of uh, COVID-19. But that's where we do find ourselves. But hopefully, both in terms of vaccination and in terms of uh, progress, we're slowly but surely, and hopefully, as the Prime Minister has put it irreversibly, moving forwards to better times. So starting with times, everyone is aware of the fact that the clocks will go forward as they invariably do at this time of the year, the last weekend in March, on Moitzoi Shabbos, which will be first Seder night. And that automatically presents us with something of a challenge in terms of the question of do we remain on GMT till after the end of first two days Yontov, change to BST before uh, Yontov uh, comes in, or are there any other particular options? Of course, the first question which no one actually uh, thinks about or talks about to the same extent is, why can't we change mechanical clocks or watches on Shabbos? or Yom Tov. And that's the first five sources of the Shia. Just thought it would be interesting to look at something rather different in the context of this year's Pesach and the question of the changing of clocks um, as to where actually the sources are for changing or not changing clocks and watches on Shabbos and Yom Tov. Now, early timepieces were known already in the days of the Mechaber of the Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yos Yosakara, who lived in the 16th century. And if you look at source number one, he refers to something which is Ma Shemoira al Hashos, that which indicates the hours, the time. Shekorin Ari Lozo, it was referred to as an Ari Lozo, we'll see what that is in a moment. There's a question as to whether, and we'll call it now not a watch or a clock, just a timepiece, something which indicates the time. Is it considered to be muktza or not? Are you allowed to move it on Shabbos Yom Tov? And the Mechaba concludes, Kva poshta minag leser. the minag is that is considered to be something that one is muktza, one can't move on Shabbos Yom Tov. This is not yet talking about uh, wristwatches, which were apparently only uh, invented in the 19th century. Pocket watches were before that, and even earlier than that were um, various types of uh, clocks, as, as we'll see, 
which would uh, be able to uh, indicate for us um, by which we're able to tell the time. The earliest type of timepieces were either something similar to what we would know today as an egg timer, something where sand ran through from one end of a tube through a narrow aperture to the other end of a tube. That was one way in which uh, one might be able to tell the time. And the other, of course, was by a, a sundial. And this becomes clear in source number two, where the Mishnah Brewer elaborates on the original statements of the Shulchan Aruch, who seems to suggest that timepieces are mukt not to be moved on Shabbos Yontav. And the Mishnah Brewer explains what is the Mechaber talking about um, when uh, Mishnah Brewer, of course, is uh, late 19th, early 20th century. And he's saying that the, the Mechaber, the author of Shuch Nach, Rabbi Yosef Karo, is referring to the following when he talks about his type of timepiece. He's referring to a Keli Shem Malim Bechel, something, a utensil which is filled with sand, and the sand flows through a narrow hole or aperture at the bottom of the timepiece and it, it has different lines which the sand fills in order to give one an idea of the passage of time or it might be or by virtue of when the shadow reaches a particular uh, place on the timepiece, that which we would know as a sundial, that is another way of being able to tell the time. There's a question as to whether you can move these type of very basic timepieces. It could be that this is considered something which is involved in measurement. It's measuring the time, the uh, advancing uh, shadows. And it would be something which is considered in the category of mukta as an item which is you, which, which who, whose focus, whose purpose no, is something it. which is prohibited on Shabbos. Because measuring something on Shabbos, the Gemara explains for one of two reasons. Either it might be because of Mecca Chumemka, because of buying and selling, or it may be Uvdin Dechel, something which is considered to be um, like a, um, a, a, a weekday activity. So, Menidim Shabbos also Kashen Shal Mitzah. Even if one would learn, be able to study Torah by virtue of knowing the time for the shear to start, perhaps more importantly for the shear to end, but to know uh, something about the nature of the shear, the main purpose for which these timepieces, uh, or to the main purpose to which they were put, was not for the basis of um of uh, something which is a mitzvah, a utensil which is not itself actually muksa, but its purpose is muksa, may be used if you need to, uh, maybe moved on Shabbos Yontif if you need to use it for a particular um, given purpose as far as its place is concerned, or even perhaps to uh, use it as a I don't know what you might want to use it for some some purpose or another, which is not its its main purpose, which would be mukta. Ukva poshta lesser, and the minig says the mission in generally is that these larger I don't want to quite call them clocks as yet, but time measuring pieces would not be will be considered mukta. Uvazega, using the Yiddish word, the Chofetz Chaim writes it, probably in the early 20th century, which is a, a watch, Shelonu Yesh Lahatia. A watch is not considered to be Muktzah on Shabbos. And in the small square brackets in source number two, I explain why. This is brought down there by Shlomo Zaman Erbach, who says that as far as our watches are concerned, um, the, 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 these rather primitive and early timepieces which were used either by virtue of measuring through the uh, grains of sand that went from one then to the other of the timepiece or by even a sundial etc they were specifically used for work purposes and that's why it's considered to be a kalia also limdidas in yonim shechel it's something which is associated with uvdin dechel workday weekday activity 
or with measurement which is associated with Mecca Humemka, with business professional activity, and that is considered to be inappropriate to be used on Shabbos Yom Tov and Zmukta. Whereas our timepieces nowadays, our watches, our wrist watches, even pocket watches, are not used for the purpose which is associated with something that is uh, uh, work, weekday activity, and therefore should not be considered as mukta. And then he goes on to say, makes a distinction. Either pocket watches or wrist watches, they are not mukta. Those which are larger, which are considered to be like uh, rather than watches, they're clocks, wool clocks. Also, you're not allowed to move them on Shabbos. There is a din in Hilchus Muktzah, and this would apply, by the way, to a picture on the wall as well. Same idea. Where something has a fixed place and you don't normally expect to move it from that fixed place, it's considered to be a mukta item that shouldn't be moved on Shabbos Yontav. So the question is, if you're allowed, if you have an open clock where you don't have a cover over the clock face and you want to be able to move the hands on the clock, that might be a possibility, but you certainly cannot move even a mechanical, a non-battery clock, you can't move on Shabbos Yontav. Then we have in source number three, another interesting possibility, which shows us that even in the days of the Shulchan Aruch, there were certain timepieces which were already known, such as a, a, a chiming clock. Zuka Makashkesh Lashois, also Alide Mishkolois, also Alide Mishkolois. If you have some sort of clock, chiming clock, which is operated by weights, as we know, um, that was the very earliest type of mechanisms which were used in clocks. You're allowed to set the clock up, and even though it's going to chime on Shabbos, that's not considered to be problematic. Some of you may be familiar with halacha, that there is... Um, a, a problem on Shabbos of Hashmoas Koil, of hearing something which you would consider to be associated with a weekday activity. So if to have a various m machinery working in the house uh, and hearing that noise on Shabbos is inappropriate. But if you have something on Shabbos which is making a particular noise, which has been set up before Shabbos, it's not a noise which is irritating. It's sort of letting chiming the hours, the quarter of the hours, the half hours, whatever it may be. That's not problematic. Explains the Mishnah Bura why is a chiming clock set before Shabbos is not problematic. Muta Orch, you're allowed to set it up because we're not concerned that when people hear the sound of that clock chiming, they'll be concerned maybe the person set this clock up and set it in motion on Shabbos. Everybody knows you wind up the clock, you set the mechanisms in place, you get the pendulum working, you put the weights in, you get, get the weights in, uh, in equilibrium before Shabbos comes in. I will be Shabbos, but you should know on Shabbos itself, when it comes to operating this type of clock, you're not allowed, if the clock has stopped, to do anything to stimulate, to ensure the clock's going to start working. Even if you're just going to move the metal um, piece, which would cause the clock to start ticking again so you just give it a little nudge even that is something which is not permitted this is considered repairing an article which is currently not working on Shabbos itself there is another concern that even when the clock is working quite healthily and happily on Shabbos itself if you start interfering with it there is is a significant risk that you may upset the balance of the clock and it will stop working for a time. And when you then start it working again, that will be a problem of Tikkun Mona. And therefore, the advice is that if you've got a mechanical clock or clock with, with, which works with, with weights and with uh, a pendulum, you can set up a grandfather's style clock, you can set it up to work before Shabbos, nothing wrong with it uh, chiming on Shabbos itself. 
but not to interfere with working on Shabbos itself. In source number five, we come to the question which really is relevant to us this coming Motsi Shabbos, and that is to move the hands of the clock to the right time. And remember, this could be one of three or four scenarios. It could be a wristwatch. It could be a wool clock. It could be a pocket clock. Or it could be one of these other types of more primitive time measuring devices. So Rebel Yashiv seemed to want to say it's permitted. And similarly, Rebbe Shlomo Zaman Erbach writes in his Minchas Shlomo Chelet Beis, uh, Lamad Heyud Beis, and explains why is this not considered to be Tikkun Mono? Why is adjusting the time on a, 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 a clock or watch not considered to be mending the item? So, for example, one of the reasons on Shabbos that we're not allowed to play musical instruments is because often musical instruments require some form of adjustment to tune them etc and that is tikkun mana even finessing fine tuning an item is problematic on Shabbos and Yom Tov. but says um Reb Shlomo Zalman that in the case of a watch you're not actually changing the mechanism by which the watch or the clock is working. All you're doing is moving the hands, and moving the hands should not be considered to be problematic in terms of you're not moving the, the watch or the clock itself, you're just moving the hands on the clock face. There are other poskim who say, however, that if when you pull out the pin or the winder, you actually stop the mechanism temporarily. And by the way, I've looked into this a bit, done a bit of research on this. Different types of watches work different in respect. Sometimes when you pull out the pin, you're just disengaging the hands from the mechanism which continues to work, which would not be problematic. But if you actually stop the whole mechanism working, like we saw in force no source number four, that that would be problematic on Shabbos and Yom Tov. So you, um, you, you can't do that when it comes to a watch or a clock. And um, the Rav Shlomo Zaman himself quotes the Kafa Chaim, who says that in Yerushalayim the Minog was not to adjust clocks or watches on Shabbos Yom Tov at all. And there's also the opinion of Rav Nissen Karelitz um, quoted here, who says that you may not adjust a clock or a watch on Shabbos or Yom Tov because of the Chashash Tikkun Mana. And there's a difference of opinion there between great Achreinim, Rabbi Yashiv and Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Erbach on the one hand who seem to be more inclined to permit the adjustment of a time on a clock uh, or a watch and um, Rabbi Nissen Karelitz who certainly forbids it and the Kafa Chaim who says that the Minig is not to do so. So practically I've yet to find a Luach which suggests that it's not problematic to adjust a clock on Shabbos and Yom Tov. And so you get ones which offer you the times in BST and those in GMT and those in both and those. Uh, all gets a little bit confusing. The last time this happened was in 1994 when we were in Manchester. And I remember it being quite an interesting um, proposition to try and present this to the community uh, in a way that everyone would agree would be a way that would work. Uh, I'm very pleased to note that the next time this problem will happen is in 2048. And even if I last well by myself by, by date, I'm sure it will be my successors or my successors' successors' problem if we're not all together in Yerushalayim, our credit previous Mashiach's skin long before that time. But for this year, what I've done on the timesheets, as you will have noticed, if you looked at them, they've all gone out from the office. What I've done is to make to note the fact that the clocks change on Matzei Shabbos and that watches and clocks should not be adjusted on Shabbos or on Yom Tov, which leaves one with four possibilities. You can, if you like, uh, choose to change to BST before Shabbos comes in on Friday afternoon and just run all your times in BST. Bit of a problem because if you get confused, you might come to be eating chomets when you shouldn't on Shabbos, which is Erev Pesach. And of course, it won't actually be BST until 1 a.m. on Motzei Shabbos itself. You could choose to leave your clocks as they are on GMT and just have to try and remember throughout the two days of Yom Tov from when you wake up on Thursday Pesach that when your clock says half past eight, you're an hour late for the half past eight minion and they just better try and get along to the half past nine minion, etc. 
Um, one suggestion, which I think is quite a sweet suggestion that's been made by one or two people to me is, and I can see Rodney Berman who's on the uh, share this evening, one of the people who suggested this is that you could have two different clocks, one set to GMT, one set to BST, and uh, till one o'clock in the morning, you look at one clock, and from one o'clock on Nazi Shabbos, you look at the second clock, which will be the one we've set to BST. That's a third possibility. Um, the other possibility, which I don't want to consider, is that, uh, but it is a, a fact that some people may not even realize and may just come to change their clocks anyway, unfortunately. And uh, at least we can have a limud zechus that Rebel Yashiv and Rebel Shlomo Zaman seem to think theoretically at any weight that if you're talking about a mechanical clock, that it, it may not be actual tikkun mono, it may not even be Nisa Drabonon, although it seems to be pretty much the widespread minhag that we do not change clocks and adjust watches on Shabbos or Yom Tov. So that's the first part of the sheer a bit of background. And one of the things, if I've learned nothing else over my years in Hendon, is that if I were to tell everybody, change all your clocks to GMT, everyone would put leave all your clocks on GMT, they'd all change to BST. If I say to everybody, change to BST, everyone would rain on GMT. And why didn't you do this? Why didn't you? That's so the best they can do is draw to your attention what the issue is. Everyone, I trust to be very intelligent and mature, work it out. You can have two clocks, three clocks, four clocks, do you know what the time is in Tokyo, you can know what the time is in New Zealand, whatever you want to have out on around your walls over Shabbos and Yonder Gazuntahit, just remember not to adjust your clocks and watches on Shabbos and Yonder. Work out the system you're going to use in order to know what the right time is to turn up at the right minion at the right time. Make sure that you've signed in for the right minion for COVID protection reasons and that you arrive promptly and leave promptly and other than that as far as the clocks are concerned i wish everyone a wonderful time over shabbos and first two days pesach that's the first part of the shir second part of the shir is the era of pesach on shabbos question now i'm giving you the background or the backstory, if you like, to the guidelines which you've all received, should have all received, have been sent out from the office uh, over recent days and weeks. Um, how to make um, Erev Pesach, which is on Shabbos, as easy a proposition as possible. What's the main question? What's the main issue to do with, to, to, to be dealt with here? In essence, we will regard Friday as being akin to Erev Pesach, in terms of being Pesach when Shabbos comes in. Let's have a look at source number six together. Yud Dalet Shechalios B'Shabbos, when the 14th of Nisan falls out on Shabbos, as it does this year. Beidkin, the, the last time this happened was 2008, last time before that was 2005. Next time will be 2025, and there'll be then year a 20-year break till 2045. So it doesn't happen at particularly regular intervals, and um, it, it doesn't happen every year or even every couple of years. It's not like leap years, etc. When the 14th of Nisan is on Shabbos, Boyd Kindel Yud Gimel will do Badikas Chomets tomorrow night, Thursday night, 13th, the day earlier. Umavarin HaKolif Neha Shabbos, we clear everything away before Shabbos. Umesharin Mosn Shtei Sudas L'Tzorik Shabbos, we leave just enough Chomets, Mosn food, staple, for the two Shabbos meals. By the way, everyone's asked me, or a number of asked me the question, how are we able to eat that chomets when surely we've sold our chomets to the non-Jew? The sale of chomets takes place also a day, a day earlier on the Friday. So how can we eat the chomets? First of all, in the actual shtar harshah, in the actual document by which I'm permitted to sell the chomets on behalf of all those who are selling it with me, it says that the chomets is sold chutz misudas Shabbos excluding that chomets, the, the chomets food we want to leave over for Shabbos. There still remains a problem, however, because Sudash Lishis, Zmana Acha Mincha, Sudash Lishis, the correct time is after Mincha, and then Ozen Yocholaso Soleba Matzo Voleba Chomets. You can't make Hamaitzi at Sudash Lishis time. This is the Machaba who's pasking for the Svadim speaking here. We certainly can't do this. You can't have Matzo because on Erev Pesach we don't eat Matzo at all because we want its taste to be fresh and exciting for the evening, for the Seder. Uh, 
So you can't make matzah, and you can't make it with chametz because it's too late as far as chametz is concerned. You have to finish eating chametz by 10 a.m. here in London on Shabbos morning. So when you want to have your Shabbos shudas, it's too late to have chametz. Elo matzah ashiro. So the Mechaba suggests you can use matzah ashiro, which is matzah which has been made with fruit juice rather than water, which we Ashkenazim do not use on Pesach, as we'll see in a moment. So the Mechaba suggests that you use matzah ashiro for your shalashudas, and you need to make it before the 10th seasonal hour of the day, which is round about 3.15 GMT, 15 BST. That's the time uh, by which you have to have your meal if you want to have substantive food in that third meal. Hagar says the Ramah in the shaded text in source number six. As we'll see in a moment, the minak of the Ashkenazim is not to eat matzah ashira on Pesach. You've got no choice but to have sudashlishis with fruit or with meat or with fish, but not to have it with matzah ashira. You can't actually wash for that shalashiris unusually. Uh, we normally do wash for the third meal. We'll see there are certain other suggestions. The way that we take pragmatically is we have two meals for which we wash, third meal for which we will not actually wash. Now, the matzah ashira question, which is an interesting one, is the one we deal with in source number seven. And the reason why the Sephardim use Matzah Ashir on Pesach is because the Machaba says, source number seven, May Perus Bolem Maim, Eimach Misin Klau. The Machaba, and this is the view of the Sephardim, is that pure fruit juice, not reconstituted fruit juice, which has got a quantity of water in it, but pure, 100% pure fruit juice uh, does not cause chimuts, does not cause leavening. It only causes what's known as sirchen, like with kidneys, which again, the Svadim eat, but Ashkenazim don't eat. That's a, a process of some form of... Um, uh, not actually of, of, of leavening process, but some form of uh, process whereby there is a, a deterioration and a change, a chemical change to the composition of the food stuff, but it's not actually chimut's not leavening. So may peres blame imach mitzin klal umutu lechol pesach and the mechaber says in shulchan aruch erachaim tov samach base. This is source number seven. He says that you can eat on pesach matzah which has been kneaded with fruit juice. Afilu shuasa kol ayim. Now you know that we try to produce, well, we have to produce our matzahs within 18 minutes from when water is introduced to the flour, from the beginning of the kneading process until the matzah is put into the oven to matzah bait, must be no more than 18 minutes. But if you use fruit juice, says the machabe, since it can't make chametz, even if you waited the whole day till the matzahs were actually baked, it's not chametz. You can't fulfill your obligation on Seder night with um, these types of matzahs, with the matzah shira, because it's matzah shira. And the verse tells us, Lechem oini, ki v'chipazon yotzosom im Yitzroim, you left the land of Egypt hastily, and shivas jom t'cholov matzahs lechem oini, you have to eat the, the poor bread. And therefore you can't use matzah shira for the mitzvah of matzah, even according to the Svatim. The Ramah adds on there, and he says, v'b'nus elu ein nergin lolosh me peris, in in the, amongst the Ashkenazim, Aminag is not to use fruit juice matzahs, egg matzahs, matzah ashira, um, honey matzah, whatever it may be, not to use that on Pesach. We don't even smear the surface of the matzahs with fruit juice after they've been baked. This is not because of Gabrox, that's not the problem. The problem here is of matzah ashira. And for Ashkenazim, we cannot use egg or fruit juice matzahs, matzah shira, unless it's a really difficult situation where you've got an unwell person, an elderly person who needs this, says the Mishnah Brewer, even if as Ashkenazim, we're going to use um, 
egg or matzah shira, fruit matzahs or honey matzahs for poor people, for, for someone who's unwell, someone who has a particular need, an elderly person, unwell person. You've got to bake them straight away. You can't rely on the head of the dispensation that the Mechaba mentioned, Rios Karo, that because it doesn't become chomets, you can't, you can leave it the whole day and don't need to worry about it rising at all. Concludes the Mishnah Bru, and he says, so the concludes the Mishnah Bru, then he says that if you introduce water together with the fruit juice, that's problematic and you can't use Matzah Ashira. So this is Matzah Ashira on Pesach. This is not yet the question of Matzah Ashira on Erev Pesach. In source number eight, we go into the inner workings of the Shaila of Shalashudas and what, what one can do with this problem. And it is a betwixt and between, between problem. We're really caught out almost on this Shabbos of Erev Pesach because Lechachila, in the first instance, one should have Shalashudas after Mincha time and one should have it on bread or on matzah to make hamaitzi. And whatever we try to do, however we try to solve this problem, we're not going to come to the perfect answer. That's the point. Says Mishnah Bura, line two of source number eight, I'm the El Basim and Reish Tati Aleph Sifei. This is talking about the halachas of Shalash Shudas itself, the third Shabbos meal. There are different opinions amongst the Poskim. Man's Allah decides if he needs made dafka a pass on bread or into Sagi Gankim Bishadvarim, or you can have other items to eat. On this, he says, because when you find yourself really caught out almost and you can't wash and you can't have your shoulders in the normal way, you can rely on the lenient opinions and therefore you can have boss of a dog, you can have meat and fish, and there's a question whether you can have matzo meal in that fish or not. We'll come on to that in a moment. But that meat and fish is better than just having fruit alone. He says, even to have some foods which have got matzah meal in them may be permitted. Again, we have the problem. You, the era of Pesach, everyone knows you can't eat matzah. You can have food which have got matzah meal in it, provided that that matzah meal has been properly crushed and sort of pulverized and like in knedlech in 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 matzah bowls it's then uh not recognized anymore as being matzah that's acceptable but something where the matzah is more coarse we'll come on to that uh, over the page in a moment then it may be problematic if you're going to have peris of most of a dog if you're going to have fruit or meat and fish for your shalashudas then you can have it even after shah series even after the 10th hour but you should be careful only to eat, not eat too much. Shouldn't fill yourself up because you want to have a good appetite for the matzah at the Seder. The Achronim say there's one other possibility, and that is you can actually, we're going to be davening, those of us who go to the early mini Shabbos will be davening at 7 o'clock. We'll probably get home for 8.30 or just after, make Kiddush, make Hamotzi on the, on, on, on the, on, on the actual Chomets, um bread. And by the way, if you noticed on the carefully produced flyer, the image that we have is of, rather than chalas, using pita bread, hamaitzi pita bread, because that tends to make less crumbs. And it's perfectly acceptable, as long as you've got complete pita breads, may well be better than crusty, crumbly chalas to use something, or use challah rolls, whatever it would be, to minimize the spread of chomets. And certainly one doesn't eat that chomets on one's actual Pesach dick table or with one's Pesach dick crockery, etc. Whichever it may be, the suggestion is that in the morning you come home, make Yiddish, make hamaitzi, have a quick meal, bench, go out for a little walk for quarter now 20 minutes, come back, wash again, and have a third meal, have a shalashudas, all done and dusted before 10 a.m. I'm not recommending this for two reasons. Because the Mishnah Baruch says at the end there are two particular problems with this, even though the Vilna go on like this idea. Problem number one is that you've got to finish all your chomets by 10 a.m. Who can have two meals within probably less than an hour? That's problem number one. Problem number two is... If you start doing this sort of thing, there's what is known as a problem of a bracha shein and an unnecessary bracha. To 
unnaturally break your first meal, bench, then go and wash again and bench again afterwards, may well be making brochas which are not strictly necessary and therefore best avoided. That's why we suggest having the Mosm Shtesudas, the two meals which you will have Hamoitzi for, and Hamoitzi will be Chomets Hamoitzi, eaten on the side table. Again, you can look at the guidelines that we sent out, which make clear how to do that. The Sharad Siyin, in source number nine, turning over the page, advises us to avoid heavily matzah-based foods all day Erev Pesach. And he says there, bring down from the um, the the the, uh, the, the Chai Odom, he says, that um, based on the, the opinion of the Mogin Avram, although the Chai Odom would say you could have Knedlech and even Chremzlech, which are like um, matzah meal pancakes, you could have those also on, on Erev Pesach, which is on Shabbos. The Chai Odom says you shouldn't do uh, matzah meal. He talks about as well using matzah, which has been boiled up and then crushed and made into uh, something which is no longer recognizable not so suitable for the mitzvah. The Mogin of Ram says, don't do this. And the Biagra says, based on the Rambam, also lechel matzah, ashir v'chim matzah, mishnah, be'er of Pesach. He actually says you shouldn't eat matzah, ashira or boiled matzah on Erev Pesach, even before Shor Asiris. And the um, the Shadzian says it would appear that his opinion, the opinion of the Vilna Gon, is like that of the Rambam, that you should avoid having heavily impregnated matzah products, coarse matzah products. And this is we see in sources number 10 and 11. Very interesting observation about different grades of matzah meal. How coarse does matzah meal have to be? to remain still as matzah, or how fine does it have to be to be considered to be matzah meal? One very big difference is in Hilchus Brochus. If you have something which is still considered to be matzah, then you have to make hamotzi over it. However, something like kanedlach, or if you have cake which has got matzah meal in it, where the matzah meal has been very finely worked into the dough, then you would make mazonus rather than hamotzi. So there are a number of differences um, as far as matzah meal is concerned. The advice in general would be that something which is you can still recognize as being matzah, you shouldn't use at all on Erev Pesach. And even matzah ashira, we'll see later on from Rav Shlomo Zalman Erbach, it seems to be that matzah ashira is not a good idea in the morning. The evening is possible. And by the way, those who want to use matzah ashira because they're concerned, they don't want to have actual comments in their house, I wouldn't argue there's a good basis here to do so halachically. But nonetheless, we'll see in sources 10 and 11 now that there is a, a bit of a cause for concern about eating something which is too close to matzah itself, even though it's not real matzah, on Erev Pesach, on the day of Erev Pesach. On Friday night, this is not a problem, but on the day of Erev Pesach, on Shabbos, is a problem. So in source number 10, we are told by the Mechaba that before the 10th hour of the day, before mid-afternoon, 3.15-ish, you're allowed to eat matzah shira, but matzah shira is in Belayla, asurin lechel kodim abra also, as we know, we do not allow to eat matzah the entire 14th day of um, Nisan, Erev Mishnabur explains in the name of the Rambam that one should recognize that in the evening you're eating the matzah for the purposes of the mitzvah and for no other purpose. The cotton shane dear mashim is something interesting. Halochal slipped in here. A young child, a young toddler who doesn't understand yet the, the fine points in Sears Mitzrayim, Mutala Achiloi, you're allowed to give him matzah to eat even on Erev Pesach itself. So if someone's worrying about a toddler and how they're going to keep them occupied and what they're going to, going to eat, nothing wrong in giving a piece of matzah to a toddler even on Erev Pesach itself. Matzah shenefa ketikuna matzah, which has been properly baked, and afterwards nisparov and elisha beyain v'shemen. Afterwards, it's been crushed up and um, being mixed up with wine and and oil or honey or whatever it may be. Ain a nikros matzah shira. That's not matzah shira. Asur la'ochlebe of pesach, and you can't eat on of pesach because the matzah is still, although it's been crushed, too identifiable as matzah. And again, we see here in source number 11, the um, explanation to this. 
just by I remember when we were um, younger and um, there weren't these fancy Pesach breakfast cereals. So what did everyone eat for breakfast if you were not particular about Kaprox? You would crush up matzah and make matzah cereal in a bowl and put a bit of cocoa with a bit of milk and you would think you were having matzah pops or whatever you wanted to call it, etc. What brocha do you make on that? Clearly you've got to wash, you've got to make hamotzi because you haven't taken the name of matzah away just because you've crushed them up into smaller bits and made them something akin to cereal you've, that, and, and that you couldn't eat down there a Pesach either. Nevertheless, if you do make some sort of matzah cake or matzah um, creation uh, with small pieces of matzah, you couldn't use that for the mitzvah of matzah at night because, as we explained earlier in Kuf Samaches, the matzah has got to be just plain matzah on Leila Seda. And um, if he goes on to say at the end of source number 11, if you actually cooked the matzah, boiled the matzah up in a pot, and uh, you, you, he, the example he gives here is making um, knedlech, etc., um, uh, or you've actually boiled the matzah in water in a keli rishon, then you could eat it before shah serious. Deserve vaday lo mikri matzah. That's not considered matzah. After the 10th hour, it's no longer a problem of eating matzah. It's a problem of eating a food which is too filling and won't allow you to fulfill the mitzvah properly in the evening. Now, in source number 12, what about coming back to this question of matzah shiro on Friday night and on Shabbos day of the 14th of Nisan? So here we find that even for us Ashkenazim, for whom it's a problem to have matzah ashira on Pesach because we would consider it to be possible chametz, nevertheless, if a person has got difficulty uh, with being able to uh, eat chametz on Erev Pesach, so you're worried about maybe crumbs getting uh, caught up in one's teeth, or where you've got uh, pa patients or hospitalized old age homes, so that Rabbi Yashiv there paskened that better than having chomets in those two meals, one should have matzah mavusheles, matzah like sort of kneidlach uh, or similar, um, and make hamotzi on that. Um, interestingly, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman says a very interesting thing towards the end of source number 12. He says that although, according to all opinions, one can fulfill the mitzvah of Lechem Mishnah of Hamaitzi on Sudas Leil Shabbos, the Friday night meal with Matzah Mavusheles, and likewise with Matzah Ashira, Friday night only, because if you remember, on the basis of source number nine, the opinion of the Gon, according to the Rambam, that you shouldn't eat Matzah Ashir or Matzah Moshe, the whole of Erev Pesach. So he says, therefore, it's only possible to eat Matzah Ashir on Friday night, but not Shabbos by day. There are problems as far as Matzah Ashir is concerned, according to this. Still, Reb uh, Shlomo Zaman didn't want to permit the use of Matzah Ashir, for example, where may it happen again speedily in our days that one's able to go away and spend Pesach, not that I'm recommending that necessarily, but for those who do so and want to go to hotels, whatever, etc. He says, don't use Matzah Ashira or Matzah Moshelis in the era of Pesach of Shabbos. Ki ein roi lik an rabim. This is not a good thing to use for the masses. In other words, it's a dispensation which one can use if you've got no other way of dealing with the problem and you're sort of super nervous about having any chomets around you want to use matzashira, so use matzashira. But don't People shouldn't come too used to the idea of matzashira. Some say it's because there's a risk of becoming uh, too familiar with the matzashira, and you may thereby come to use it on Pesach itself for your seder. Others say that there are, there are other reasons. At any rate, uh, matzashira is a possibility that some people may be doing, but we've seen here where there may be problems associated with it. What about, and someone put this shyly to me, says, Rabbi Ginsbury, I don't particularly like Pesachic food. Maybe one or two people on this uh, Zoom chat, with the Zoom conversation, I would agree with that as well. So I'd like to have normal chomets food till 10 o'clock on Shabbos. Can I do that? Can my wife make a chomets tik chulant to eat early Shabbos morning? 
Seems almost like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Thinking about eating a chulam early Shabbos morning. Although the early Kiddush in the good old days seemed to manage to achieve that with a great degree of aplomb together with a bit of whiskey as well. Oi, all these things perhaps a little bit problematic. Let's see source number 13, which speaks about minimizing exposure to Chomos on Shabbos Erev Pesach. And that's why in the document of sale, we only exclude Mosen Shte Sudas, Mosen for two meals. We don't want to have too, too much Chomos around for obvious reasons so we say that it, it one should uh, make sure by the way this year Erev Shabbos which is not Erev Pesach but nonetheless one gets rid of the Chomets before Chatzos that one shouldn't make a mistake as in other years to get rid of it after Chatzos very important this year when we burn the Chomets before 11.04 on Friday we won't say Kol Chamira We'll say the first Kol Chamira tomorrow night after the Badika. The next Kol Chamira needs to be said on Shabbos morning before 11.04. In fact, Rabbi Port and I were discussing that in the second minion at 10.30 for laning only and Musaf. Probably they'll take a little break at, say, around about 11 o'clock and just say, remind everyone to say Kol Chamira to renounce ownership of Chomets. Incredibly important because normally it's associated with the burning of Chomets. We won't be burning the Chomets on Shabbos morning, obviously. So must remember to say the Kol Chamira on Shabbos morning. Very important to do that. Now, continuing on, says the Shulchan Aruch, You cannot cook or prepare or, or, or bake um, Chomets dishes for this Shabbos in the way you would normally do on Shabbos. So if it's a Chomets Kegel, a Chomets Chulam, whatever it be, Ein oisin by pas at snobikori. You also shouldn't make some sort of bread or chomets concoction, which is likely to get stuck to the side of dishes. Imova ubishel v'amachul dov bigdera yefsh lekanchel yechadicham at laaver chomets. If you made a mistake, you didn't realize this halacha, you hadn't come to the Shabbos God of Drosha, and you didn't realize that you're not allowed to cook hot comets for Erev Pesach, so it would seem that Badiyavid, you're allowed to just wash off, clean off the comets to try to see you shouldn't be over the Issa comets. What's the problem here? So the problem is that um, on Shabbos, you're not allowed to wash up dishes clean dishes or clean any other items which you won't need again on Shabbos because it's hachona, you're preparing the dishes for after Shabbos or Yom Tov. And that's why in source number 14, we'll see that because we want to minimize the exposure to chametz and get rid of all chametz other than those two loaves or two pieces of pita bread that you're going to eat on for your hametzi, other that you don't want chametz around. And the risk is that, as he says in force number four, source number 14, if you cook chametz which, which adheres to the walls of the vessels, you'll need to wash them and clean them down, brush them down after eating from them. You're not allowed to do that to the dishes on Shabbos. Because you don't need them on Shabbos. In Ovo Bishel, if a person mistakenly or transgressed and cooked in those dishes, you should wash them a little bit to remove the chomets. Even says the Mishnah, even though it's not for the purpose of Shabbos, and we wouldn't normally permit such cleaning to take place on Shabbos. Sharin and Bedieved, here, where a person made a mistake and cooked chomets in dishes to be used on this Shabbos of Erev Pesach, then we would allow one to clean the dishes. We shouldn't eat the chomets. Because of the prohibition of chomets, if you can't just wipe the dishes down, you need to properly clean them. It would be better to get a non Jew to do it rather than for Jew to do the malacha themselves on Shabbos, which is Erev Pesach, of cleaning off the chomets. By the way, if we're talking already about the problems involved with chomets, on this particular Shabbos and the extent to which we want to minimize our exposure, look at source number 15, where there's another very interesting aloha brought down in the Sharatzian. You should not pour directly hot food from Pesach dick vessels into Chomets dick vessels, even though there may not be any direct contamination which is taking place um unless you don't want to use that um that that pesach dick vessel again over pesach 
And the reason for this is, explains the continuation source number 15, the Shulchan by pouring out boiling hot food or uh, liquid from a Pesach dick, from a Pesach dick utensil into a Chomet stick utensil, what you're going to be doing is the smoke is going, the steam is going to rise from the Chomet utensil back up into the Pesach dick utensil and make the Pesach dick utensil potentially a uh, Chomet stick. It's known as, it's principle known as Nitzuk in Ramon Yerodea Simon Kufei, which I've quoted there in the brackets. Mikol Mokam, nevertheless, but the in Bishop Pesach, if you use this dish afterwards to cook on Pesach, then uh, it wouldn't actually make the food osa and the cross-contamination is minimal, but you shouldn't do it. And that's why if we, when we eat on Erev Pesach, Shechalius Peshabbos, after having our Hamaitzi, we should clean ourselves down and then go over either completely to Pesach Dik and take from Pesach Dik pots onto Pesach Dik dishes, or use disposables, which of course is the easiest and most preferred option for many people nowadays anyway. In source number 16, the last thing I want to examine of the particular halachas of Erev Pesach Shechalius Peshabbos, is a person who does malach on Erev Pesach, there's a rule on Erev Pesach from midday, from Chatzos, halachic midday onwards, should be considered like Cholamoid, that you don't do work unless it's absolutely necessary, generally one desists from work. The question is this Friday, does it become almost like Erev Pesach, and we shouldn't be doing work from Chatzos on this Friday as well? So it's a very interesting question, which is discussed by the Shulchan Aruch in Tosh Samaches Sif Aleph, in source number 16. And there are two reasons given why you shouldn't do work on Erev Pesach after Chatzos, after midday. One is because that was the time when the Korban Pesach was being brought, that's in the Yerushalmi, Shkitsa Pesach, and according to that, since the Pesach, in Yetz Hashem, when we have a base of English again, would only be slaughtered on Erev Pesach itself, meaning on Shabbos. So Erev Pesach, which is uh, on Shabbos, the Friday, you don't need to throw back onto Friday the dinim of Erev Pesach, because it's only in order to, because it's like a semi because that's when the Korban Pesach was being prepared and slaughtered and, and offered. But, or be, being prepared for its offering, sorry. And that's through the Maril. Rashi gives another reason, though. Rashi says, why is Erev Pesach after Chatzot you're not allowed to work? Because you're busy at that particular time. You've got to remember to get rid of your chametz a little bit earlier in the day. You've got to prepare the matzah. You've got to prepare the morrow, get the wine ready. Everything got ready for the seder. And therefore, you shouldn't do from Malach or from Chatzot onwards because you want to get everything ready for the next day. And therefore, that would apply to Friday as well, because Friday, most of us are fortunate enough to do it, will prepare our Seder table in the dining room and we'll eat in the kitchen or the morning room over Shabbos itself. So therefore, according to that opinion, one would say that even on Friday itself, one should be a little bit concerned about doing Malacha after Chatzos. However, the Bialocha continues and says me that Rav HaPoskim knocked to time. Yerushalmi, most authorities hold with Yerushalmi that the concern is about Erepesh Chalios Peshabbos when it's Friday, the concern is with Yerushalmi about the Shkizos Korban Pesach since that wouldn't have taken place in the basement of Shabbos, in Kain Efshadeh Ein Lahachmeh, you don't need to be stringent and you can consider Friday to be like any other Erev Shabbos where we're preparing for Shabbos, preparing for Pesach, but the Issa Malocha of a normal Erev Pesach is not thrown back on to this particular Friday. Source number 17, last five or six minutes, we come to the very interesting question of supervision of apparently innocuous non chomets items for Pesach. And you'll all be aware that this year, the Basin has issued a series of guidelines with uh, like a traffic light system of those things that can't be used without supervision, those things which might be used depending on the notes with a sort of amber or yellow uh, sign and with green, those things that might be able to use without supervision. One thing that's been drawn to my attention is there are some products we don't have a formal hechsha actually printed on them, 
but have a supervision of the London based in. So for example, the question of, ne of Nescafe Gold, which is available if it has, if it's been produced here in England and has the appropriate coding on it. And you can check this out from the Passover listing on the uh, KLBD. That is actually certified as KLBD Passover and there's no reason one cannot use it. That's not included in the extremist element, which I don't feel the extremist element applies to us who have got it easier to find Hersched products in Hendon walking along Brent Street than to find non-Hersched products. There's more probably pro rata Hersched foodstuffs available along Brent Street than non-Hersched stuff. So the extremist doesn't necessarily ap apply to us. But things like Nescafe Gold, also Saxa Salt, which has got the right product code on it, which has actually been produced with a London-based in supervision for Pesach, just it doesn't say on the packet, that there's not a problem in using for Pesach if you wish to use it. The other items which are in extremis uh, have been produced specifically, this has been produced for people who live in more outlying areas, who may have difficulty in accessing uh, formal Koshla Pesach products, and you can see the list yourself, you can access it very easily through the amazing KLBD um, kosher website and the, the guidance through the United Synagogue website, truly remarkable, and um, you can look at that for, 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 for yourselves. But what is very interesting, and for those who've got the source sheets, you'll see the, thir the third source sheet has got this little piece on the language of tea. Some of us may be old enough to remember that before the days of Rebbe cards and football cards, there were tea cards that used to come in packets of tea and the language of tea. And this was shared with us um, by um, Rabbi Jeremy Conway, the director of the KLBD. Um, this tea card was actually shared with him by his late father-in-law, Diane Lerners at Sal who marked up the tea card with reference to Shari Tshuva we're going to learn through together in conclusion in a few moments' time. And if you look at this Holland smuggling tea to Britain, until the late 18th century, heavy taxes were imposed on tea in Britain, and so smuggling developed into a highly profitable and sophisticated enterprise. Dutch merchant ships would bring tea across the channel and anchor off the English coast. Small local craft took it ashore and underground passages leading from caves to remote inland lanes provided the start to a nationwide distribution network. Sounds like today the sort of the county lines drug smuggling or drug running uh, cartels, La Havdil, um, you know, nothing's, nothing's new under the sun. However, listen to the last bit. Rogue dealers were also common, passing off used tea, which had been treated and dried or mixed with fillers such as dried licorice leaves. It was not unknown even for animal um, dung to be used and mixed into this awful sort of tea leaf, secondhand tea leaf um, product that was, was available. Now, in the Shari Teshuvah, he brings down source number 17, fascinating, from the Shus Yaakov, who writes, and look at this, and source number 17, Batei, Tes Yud Yud Aleph, that refers to tea. Shomati Shirabim Persham, I've heard many people in particular not to use tea, Lefishi Yesh Ramos, because there is a concern that people cheat on this, they use the tea, and after Miyav Shimei Say, they, they dry the tea out, Limko, to sell it a second time, Shemon Ishtamish Tchilim Chomets, maybe it's used previously with Chomets, Chain Shamati Vchulu, Shamati Mishlem Vchain Rabbim. I've heard from people who are decent, honest people, many people, and therefore one should be careful. Kiba Pesach Tzorcha Chokotfei. Supervision of um, kosher le Pesach products, rigorous supervision, is a minog which goes back to the very beginning of commercial food manufacture, uh, back to the 15th century. Before that, it was all done in-house, cottage industry, as it were. It was done by every individual themselves. But uh, until that time, uh, from that time, when it was commercially produced, you need a hersh of Pesach foods. And then he says, look at the end of the last two and a half lines of Saul 17. If you get tea directly from the traders, 
who are actually the ones who source the tea from where it grows. You've got people who actually can tell. They know they're so familiar with the product. They can tell you if this is the real McCoy and this is something which hasn't been used before. Then under those circumstances, it's not been used previously. Then it may be permitted to use the product. But if you would today understand if we would understand the extent to which food technology, the number of food technologists working with KLBD to look into various different products and the times when I'm asked by people to investigate um, certain things, there's a product which people who have an allergy to eggs um, something which is produced in Australia with a Hersha, but it's a question whether it's suitable, no egg, whether it's suitable to be used on Pesach or not, is an interesting Shaila in and of itself. And it may well be that there is dispensation for someone who has an allergy to use this product, but doesn't mean that everyone else in the household can use the product as well. So I would say that the LBD have done the KLBD does a wonderful service with the information they've produced for us. And certainly where there are things which are KLBD supervised and approved, even though they may not have a stamp on them, nothing wrong using them. But the other items which have no direct supervision, but are in extremis and were needed last year where there was a genuine shortage. And if you remember, we were under such lockdown that we couldn't go out and go shopping, etc. Then it was understandable to a greater extent. For this year, those who are able to do so to get things with a Hersha are advised to do so and to be as particular as you would any other year as far as Pesach is concerned and the zechus of the efforts that we make with our prompt timekeeping I know we're a minute over time now with the shia with our prompt timekeeping with our Erev Pesach Shalias Peshabbos that we explored together and on the beautiful flyer which actually I'm very proud of our daughter Shuli who helped me by producing this and used a bit of humour uh, on the mats it says next year in person we all hope that next year indeed not only Lashon Abba Birushlein but Lashon Abba we will be able to mix families indoors and be able to have round our saber table once again families and friends part of the things that we'll be thinking about in the course of our Pesach just to remember the key times in particular that Erev Pesach which is Shabbos itself must finish eating by 10 a.m. all Chomets must make sure by 11.04 to have said Kol Chamira um, the deadline has passed for actually selling one's chumas or will do in a couple of hours time because we set Wednesday 24th as the last time for getting in your mechiras chumas. I know a very kindly local rabbi who will try to facilitate and assist if people are in absolute uh, desperate straits and haven't managed to attend to this but make sure to do that make sure to clean thoroughly make sure as well to take the schoolers the wonderful opportunities that Pesach offers to us to look optimistically on the journey from darkness to light on the on the journey from slavery to freedom on the journey to be released from all of the negative things which bedevil us in our regular daily life to a much more elevated uh, uh, connected with the divine way of life and in that way we should know all of the brachas of chag hagula zman chirusenu and we should merit to a year ahead of good health of nachas Simcha and Brocha of an end in its entirety to the effects of the pandemic, even if COVID-19, as the experts say, will be with us for some time longer. It shouldn't be something which so bedevils and constrains daily life. We should be able to get back more into normal things. As the Prime Minister described it, this irreversible journey, which may yet take a few months to complete, but should be one that we will be able to complete before too much longer. I wish everyone a Chag Kosh of Smer. Thank you all for joining and being so attentive during the course of the share this evening and uh, wishing everyone a Chag Kosh of Sameach. Thank you all so very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and good yon to Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. 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 Thank you very much, Rabbi.
Yeah, hug some air, Rabbi. 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 Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dobby. How are you? That's my Hi, Dobby. How are you? Hang on a second. I'll change that. I'm from Brazil. How are you? Yeah, 